Hi everyone. Welcome to Long Beach Public Library. Uh, our presentation of Three Sheets to the Wind with author Cynthia Barrett. Cynthia is a senior editor. Uh, at, she worked at Sterling Publishing Company. She worked at Barnes & Noble Publishing. She's an avid sailor and has a long family history near the sea. Her great-grandfather, George Washington Barrett, was a whaler out of Cold Spring Harbor and he sailed around Cape Horn three times. Her father was a lieutenant in the Navy and was in the D-Day invasion of France. She currently lives in New York City, and today she's joining us from the North Fork. Welcome, Cynthia. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you, Janine. It's a pleasure to be here in part of the library talks. Um, so I uh, finished Three Sheets to the Wind in uh, last year, 2019, and Curiously, uh, one of the last entries, uh, nautical definitions I added to the book was quarantine, which regrettably is a word we are constantly using today. But the word quarantine was um, naval in origins and it uh, started in plague ridden 14th century in the Mediterranean where uh, ships arriving were a huge health threat, threat to all coastal cities, including Venice. And they had to create a system whereby all approaching ships were inspected and those that were found to contain contagions were ordered to sit at anchor offshore for 40 days. So quarantine comes from that waiting period, which is Latin for quatrocima, meaning the 40 days. So uh, we're all feeling cabin fever right now, but I also often imagine those sailors who were on these ships for a year, many months at least, and so near and yet so far to shore, and having to wait and wait. So when my dad was a boy on the North Shore of Long Island, he sailed a wooden dinghy. He had it drilled into him that if there's an accident, always stay with the boat. Two decades later, he was in the D-Day invasion, and his patrol craft was sunk by a German battery 8,000 yards off Utah Beach. The English Channel waters were frigid 48 degrees that day in June 1944. The crew that chose to swim away from the ship died of hypothermia. The ones that clung to the hull, including my father, were eventually rescued. Growing up, my dad's naval language and love of the sea permeated our house. He told us how our great-grandfather, a whaler out of Cold Spring Harbor, sailed around Cape Horn three times. When he woke us kids, uh, five, there were five of us, every morning for school, the greeting wasn't good morning, but rise and shine. The traditional morning call for the crew to wake up, hit the deck and be ready to take orders. At bedtime, my father often stood silhouetted in my doorway and sang taps. Its lyrics are as soothing to a child as they are to a soldier. And years later, I became fascinated by how our conversation is saturated with nautical language and how unaware we are that we're speaking the language of sailors. Unlike maritime expressions, when we hear a sports metaphor, we know it. Phrases like down for the count, the ball's in their court, it's a slam dunk, are so obvious to us, we not only get that it's a sports expression, we know what sport. When the Yankees win every game in a series, it's a clean sweep. But who knows that the expression clean sweep was coined by the Dutch Admiral Martin Trump after his crushing defeat of the British in the 1652 Battle of Dungeness. In a fit of bravado, Trump fixed a broom to the masthead to signal that he had swept the British from the seas. Baseball fans today carry brooms to the ballpark to urge their team on in the final game of a series. In your wheelhouse is another nautically inspired sports metaphor. On a ship, the wheelhouse is where everything is within reach of the pilot. Likewise, a baseball batter who gets a pitch, pitch right in his zone, his wheelhouse is likely to blast it out of the park. Last winter, I was in Manhattan, Carl Schurz Park by the East River when I overheard a man telling his grandson, we're going to walk to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a mile away as the crow flies. We use this expression all the time, but without knowing that this term, which implies the most direct route somewhere, was coined at sea. When a ship was lost in coastal waters, sailors shimmied up the mast and released the crow from the cage. The crow flew directly to the nearest shore, 
The lookout platform at the top of the mast was called the crow's nest. On a typical summer long weekend, those who stay in New York City see everyone cut and run for the country by lunchtime on Friday. Today's meaning of the phrase cut and run reflects its original maritime sense. In order to make a quick escape, a captain ordered his crew to cut the anchor line and lashings of furled sails so that the boat could quickly get underway and run with the wind. This maneuver was only acceptable under dire circumstances since a lost anchor and damaged rigging was costly. And folks stuck in the city on a sparkling summer holiday might find themselves at loose ends. Loose ends is such an odd phrase. We don't know question why we use it to describe being at a loss for what to do with ourselves. Its origin comes from the experience of the period of relative calm at sea, when idle sailors were ordered to repair and splice the frayed ends of lines. Those assigned this tedious task were described as being at loose ends. During New York's annual Spring Fleet Week, people who work in Midtown see sailors and officers walking around in their pressed white uniforms. The young sailors wearing the classic Dixie Cup white sailor caps and wide bell bottoms are a reminder of how much our fashion has been influenced by the Navy. A lot of us associate bell bottoms with the 1960s and it was hippies who bought up surplus Navy bell bottoms. But before these pants became a counterculture fashion statement, they were the signature mark of a sailor's uniform. Invented by mariners, these dark blue serge trousers flared out to a wide bell shape below the knee, making it easy to roll the pant leg above the knees when swabbing the deck. And the ubiquitous blue blazer got its start in the mid 1800s when British naval officers often used their own money to purchase uniforms for the crew. Captain John Washington of the ship H.M. Blazer chose a striking blue and white uniform for his men. Originally, his crew was known as the Blazers. Before the Royal Navy rolled out official uniforms in 1857, recruits were so shabbily dressed in their patched threadbare clothing that even the low quality garments they eventually bought from the ship's store were a step up. Their most common purchase was the ubiquitous baggy pants called slops. The word sloppy comes from the Middle English word slope, meaning baggy underwear. And given today's tight fitting fashions, those of us, of us who offer loose fitting clothing can be de dismissed by fashionists as being sloppy. Fleet Week also brings to my mind another expression in the book. During Fleet Week 2819, I was walking on Vanderbilt Avenue when four young sailors came out of Grand Central. I asked to take their picture. And to my amazement, by the time I held up my cell phone, the four men had positioned themselves shoulder to shoulder and the tips of their black polished shoes were perfectly aligned. What they were doing was towing the line. For us to be told to tow the line is a negative. It's something we have to do, but don't want to. When a captain commanded the crew to attention, he expected uniformity and precision. Sailors lined up with their toes touching the seams of the planking. A sailor not standing upright and in proper alignment was ordered to tow the line. When I said goodbye to the four sailors, they asked me where the Empire State Building was. Most of us talk about the Empire State Building as being New York's most iconic skyscraper. What we might not realize is the original skyscrapers were not tall buildings, but the highest sail on a tall ship. These small triangular sails were made of light cloth and only used in fair winds. The disconnect between our frequent use of sailing terms and how little we are aware of it shows how removed we've become from the time when the world traveled by sail. Until recent history, walking or horseback were the slow plodding options for overland travel. But on the sea, ships could harness the winds at astonishing speeds. The heart of the great coastal cities were their harbors. Even those who never left home witnessed the bustle of ships, disgorging cargo, setting sail, and weighing anchor. 
there was a nautical literacy that is absent today. When you read the classic maritime works, there's an assumption that the reader will understand. Mutiny on the Bounty remains a beloved classic despite our detachment to a lot of its nautical language. In chapter four, when a storm is threatening, the authors describe how, quote, the hatches were constantly battened down and the forward deck began to leak. Bly gave orders that people should sling their hammocks in the great cabin aft. So we might not exactly know what hatches and battens are, and we might not know that aft is the back of the ship, but the phrase batten down the hatches is a completely understandable term we use today. For us, it means to prepare for trouble. Batten comes from old French baston, meaning stick or flat strip of wood. In foul weather, crew members like those on the bounty stretch tarpaulins over the hatches and pin down the edges with battens. Shakespeare drew on references to the sea so often that there's a book called Shakespeare's Sea Terms Explained that is entirely devoted to deciphering them. And subnautical terms we use today are so removed that we've completely lost the original meaning. When you have a cold, you might call work and say, I'm under the weather. Why in the world do we say that? For sailors, it meant standing watch on the windward side of the ship and being battered by wind and spray. Getting the brunt of the rough seas is to be under the weather. On the other hand, one part of the ship we all know is the sails. Sails harness the wind and a ship's structure from its hull to its masts and yards are all designed to allow sails to catch the maximum amount of wind. There's a lot going on on a sailing ship and it's mostly to do with the canvas. It's not surprising that so many expressions relate to them. The phrase get cracking describes how mail ships needing to avoid penalties for late delivery carried the maximum amount of sail and set the rigging so tautly that the sails made a cracking noise under the tension. And we have all reported with satisfaction that we've, quote, taken the wind out of some pompous person's sails. This is a figurative meaning that nicely parallels the original nautical one, describing a maneuver by which one boat passes windward and close to another boat so as to block the breeze from the other's sails. It's humiliating for captains to lose speed and have their sails sag. One of the most daunting tasks of new crew members was to know the ropes. Tall ships had miles of rigging. Each line had its own function and it was critical for sailors to correctly identify each one. Securing or unlashing the wrong line could be catastrophic. Much of our language reflects naval military action and hardware. In the 18th century, navies forced oncoming ships to identify themselves by firing a cannon shot over their bow. If the approaching ship hoisted enemy colors, an attack might ensue. Today, a shot across the bow means to get a rise out of someone. We accuse an impulsive friend behind his back of being a loose cannon. When a ship cannon actually bro broke away from its mount in heavy weather, it was a catastrophic event. The cannon rolled uncontrollably around the deck, harming everything in its path. In his novel, 93, Victor Hugo captures this horrific moment. Something terrible had just happened. One of the cannonades of the battery, a 24 pounder had broken loose. This is the most dangerous accident that can possibly take place on shipboard. A cannon that breaks its moorings suddenly becomes some strange supernatural beast. In a folksy way, we might call someone a son of a gun. But what sons come from a gun? The nautical origin of this expression is one of the most colorful I came across while working on the book. When British warships began allowing some women on board, the consequences were obvious. Since sailors had no privacy below deck, babies were often conceived and delivered in the relatively secluded spaces between the ship's guns. When paternity was unknown, the child was entered in the ship's log as son of a gun. In the New York Yacht Club, I came across an entry in the 1835 diary of Captain W.N. Glasscock that recounted just this kind of event. 
and his entry says, the surgeon informed me that a woman on board had been laboring for 12 hours, and if I could permit the firing of a broadside, nature would be assisted by the shock. I complied, and she was delivered of a fine male child. A recent New York Times op-ed piece accused Congress of, quote, turning a blind eye to presidential overreach. This is a popular expression that I hear constantly. It was Admiral Nelson who inspired the phrase. In one of naval history's most celebrated acts of insubordination in the heat of battle, Admiral Nelson raised his telescope to his blind eye and announced he could not see the signal flag commanding him to break off action. As the story goes, Nelson told his captain, you know, Foley, I have only one eye and I have a right to be blind sometimes. Since Nelson pulled off a spectacular victory, naval superiors naturally turned a blind eye to his disobedience. While doing research for Three Sheets to the Wind, I spent a lot of time in the New York Public Library. I hadn't originally planned to include literary passages, but as my research continued, I kept bumping into the great maritime authors like Homer, Melville, Forrester, and O'Brien. These writers all reached for the language of sailors. The most exciting research I did was in the library of the New York Yacht Club, that curious landlocked sailing club smack dab in the middle of the widest girth of the Manhattan street grid. Warren and Wetmore, the architects who designed Grand Central Terminal, also gave New York this other Beaux-Arts masterpiece. This one combines form and function. Its exterior mimics the tempest-tossed stern of a Baroque ship complete with bay windows dripping foam and framed by an elegant tangle of dolphins, seaweed, garland, and seashells. The club's library has wood paneling, hanging sconces, and slightly creaking floorboards. It feels like a ship. The only giveaway is the absence of motion. I'm not a member, but they allow researchers to use their library, which holds one of the finest maritime book collections in the world. I'd almost finished researching the book, but I felt I hadn't done my due diligence until I went to the famous Strand bookstore in, on Lower Broadway. It was in their basement maritime section that I discovered the book, Mark Well the Whale, about the history of the whalemen of Long Island. In it were whaling stories about my great grandfather, George Washington Barrett and his two brothers. The youngest brother, Freeman, got his leg caught in a harpoon line during a whale chase. The whale dragged him down several fathoms before he managed to cut the line with his sheath knife. He died of internal injuries just months after he returned home to Cold Spring Harbor. He was 35. It's this kind of early death we speak of as unfathomable. The word fathom, like so many nautical phrases, expresses emotion. Originally fathom was a unit of measurement based on the span of a man's outstretched arms. Sailors measured ocean depths, anchor chains, and cables in fathoms. Mariners eventually abandoned fathoms for meters but we on shore still reach for the word fathom to express our ability to comprehend, grasp, or get to the bottom of things. Words like feeling blue, listless, and in the doldrums also come from the sea. When we say I'm in the doldrums, we admit to being in an apathetic state of mind. In literal geographic terms, the doldrums is the belt of low pressure that extends five degrees above and below the equator. Sailors trapped under the fierce equatorial sun in this windless corridor became as listless as their ship. The name of a dreaded place evolved into the name of a dreaded emotion. Many books I came across weren't relevant to my research, but were nonetheless fascinating. One title from the early 1900s called Naval Phraseology, which is a kind of preppy handbook for boating etiquette, includes a chapter titled Courteous Expressions. In it are such exchanges as, I come on board with your permission, sir. It is a pleasure to receive you, sir. Or, may I present myself? I am so-and-so. I am delighted to make your acquaintance. Many thanks for your kindness. Please don't mention it. Can I offer you a cup of tea? 
Yes, thank you. I should like a cup very much. Since um, I'm getting to the end of our talk, I'd like to include some nautical food and drink phrases. Salt cured meat was a staple of long sea voyages. While chewing tough briny beef, sailors exchanged stories and chewed the fat. Similarly, when we chew the fat, we are exchanging friendly banter and gossip. The ship's crew also swapped information around the scuttlebutt. A butt was a large wooden water cask, and on long voyages, water was rationed by carving a hole on the barrel side so that it could only be half filled. A cask with a hole was scuttled. Not much has changed except we now gossip around a water cooler. And in rough weather, there was no time for gossip. The busy crew ate whatever food they could stash in their pockets. But at anchor or in fair weather, sailors were served meals on square wooden boards. The square shape made for easy stacking and stowing. A square meal today is much the same, good hearty food. Many of our colorful expressions about drinking come from waterfront alehouses. The phrase make a toast traces back to coastal taverns where a popular drink among sailors was a small piece of toast placed in a mulled wine or hot toddy. The admonishment to mind your P's and Q's and be on your best behavior is ironically rooted in the rough and tumble world of drinking establishments. Sailors favored tavern keepers who offered credit. To keep these tabs current, the owners wrote the names of each customer on a board and next to it, the number of P's, pints, and Q's, quarts, drunk by that sailor. Tavern keepers made sure each sailor paid up on payday. And then there's the expression, three sheets to the wind. This expression, which inspired, inspired the title of my book, stems from the similarity between a drunken sailor staggering about and a sailing ship moving erratically because its sheets are light loose and flying in the wind. For better or worse, the U.S. Navy days of rum, beer, and officers with their personal wine supply ended abruptly in 1914 when a stern Methodist teetotaler named Josephus Daniels became Secretary of the Navy. He promptly banned alcohol on all ships, Navy yards, and Navy stations. As a substitute, stewards increased orders for coffee. Navy lore has it that the disgruntled sailors tagged the poor substitute cup of Josephus Daniels and later the shorter cup of Joe. But the expression three sheets to the wind in endures in our everyday speech and in such beloved classic as Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. The character Long John Silver denies he's drunk. Maybe you think we were all a sheet in the wind's eye, but I tell you I was sober. As long as Treasure Island remains a beloved maritime classic, people will be accusing each other of being three sheets to the wind. Thank you.